your seats. just my job to keep this flowing nice and smooth so that we can get out of here by midnight, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can do that? Um, just, uh, I don't think you guys realize just how lucky you are. Okay? And we thank you all for coming. This is awesome. But you are so lucky that you get to watch a Baptist. <laughs> A Southern Baptist, no doubt, with the accent, have a dialogue with a Roman Catholic with a moderator who looks like a Mormon. <laughs> How lucky is that? So just a little, quick little background. I teach geospatial science at Oregon Tech. That does not qualify me to do this in any way, shape, or form. I was able to find the building, so I guess that's one thing. Um, I am visually impaired, okay? So if uh, you have, if that comes into play, I might not see you. So if you have a question or something, get your hand up there a lot. Um, I probably see a little better than you think. Like I could tell that I got the yellow ruler pronounced <laughs> today. So we're going to have fun. Okay, goal number one is to have fun, yes. and then, uh, and uh, that's the only goal I can think of, right? So I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to talk about what we're actually doing, okay? Okay. Uh, dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity you have given us to glorify you by discussing you. We affirm that that is a form of worship, and shows that we, uh, it's a way that we can show that we love you. And I just pray that everybody will have a sweet time tonight and their fellowship will be sweet with one another. And we just thank you so much that we still live in a country where we are allowed to do this. And I just uh, thank you so much for the grace and mercy they've shown in my life. And we thank you for, um, above all, uh, for dying for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Um, uh, like I said, we're, we're pretty fortunate to live in a country where we can do this. Okay, so if you were in communist China, we couldn't do this. If you were in Islamic Saudi Arabia, we couldn't do this. Ashland, we couldn't do this. <laughs> we're, uh, I, I work at OIT, I can take digs at Southern Oregon University. <laughs> So we, um, the topic of tonight, I'll talk about the topic, and then I'll introduce our victims, our guests, and then we will, um, I'll tell you how the rules work, and then where we're going. Does that sound good? Yep. Yes. Sounds good? Okay. Um, the topic of tonight is where and how does a Christian find ultimate truth? Okay, so we're thinking three different things there, the where, the how, and then Christian ultimate truth. So four things actually. Okay, and just as an illustration, um, I this is a ruler, right? And I don't know if you noticed. I actually measured this building before we started. And did you know that you can fit 2.2 Evergreen Baptist churches in this room right now? <laughs> so, that's a joke, but probably not that far off. But it's a very small little church. Um, but how how long is this? Twelve inches. Twelve inches. Okay, how do we know that? All rulers are 12 inches, okay. So we think this is 12 inches. Well, in order to solve that, I guess we could measure it, right? Okay, it's 12 inches. Did I? Did we know that it's 12 inches? Kind of, right? Because how do we know that this one's 12 inches? Okay, so what this is, 
is this is illustrating the, the need for an ultimate standard, okay? So there's an actual government agency that is in control of measures and weights, and they have the official 12-inch ruler okay, that is then used to make all other 12-inch rulers, okay? How do we know that one is 12 inches? Well, that could be a different conversation. But that is the ultimate standard for a ruler. So when we say, how does a Christian, where and how does a Christian obtain ultimate knowledge, that's what we're referring to. Okay, not whether you can know who your postman is or something like that. It's the ultimate. What do you, how do you measure all other truth? Okay, does that make sense? That's what we're shooting for. And when, the way we set this up is this used to be a $5 word, but now with inflation, it's probably a $10 word. But this, um, we set it up as an interrogative. Okay? And all that means is that the debate topic is a question. And that's important because that means both sides share what we call the burden of proof. Okay? And I realize this is just a dialogue, but I might just use the word debate accidentally. But normally, sometimes you would set it up as a statement, and then you have an affirmative and a negative, and the affirmative is the one that's supposed to do the work. Okay? In this one, they're shared. Okay? So we're saying that in this dialogue, both sides equally share the responsibility to make their case. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And the way it's going to work is they'll each give an opening statement. If they know the rules, I know the rules, and in about 48 seconds you'll know the rules. And we'll all be on the same page, okay? It makes my job very easy. So they'll each give an opening statement, and that's where they make their case. Okay? They are putting forth their argument, not like a neener neener argument but just a position okay this is their position then they will come back and they'll do a 10 minute what's called a rebuttal and that's the time where they can respond to what was put forward in the other person's opening statement okay we will then i think at that point it's a good time to take a break okay little the restrooms down the hall right everybody's gonna crowd there and then we'll come back and we'll do 15 minutes of cross-examination on each side. And all that means is one of them, so if uh, Vic is going first, he will come up here and he will ask Pastor Matt questions. Okay, and the rules there are he has to ask questions. Okay, so you can kind of set it up. But if it sounds like it's not going to be a question, if it's more of a position that's being put forward, then we need to turn it into a question, okay? And then the rule for the person answering the questions is they need to answer not answer with a question. Okay, it's not their time to ask questions. So those are just a few things that I'll have to say, okay, let's, let's get that a little bit more uh, along with the, the rules. And, and that's really just as a sign of respect to you guys. Okay, if it flows better, if we're following some structure, it's going to be better for you guys. Because that's, that's one of the reasons we're here, is for you guys to hear uh, different viewpoints, okay? And on that note, on that point, also, you're probably going to, if I was a betting man, I'd probably even bet a dollar on this. You're probably going to hear some things you disagree with, okay? Regardless of what your position is, that's kind of the point, okay, is to hear some things you disagree with. Please just don't get offended, okay? Don't storm out. Don't flip any tables. Don't, if you throw stuff, don't throw at me, okay? But we can just... We can have fun, we can listen to what each other, uh, what we all believe, in a respectful manner. And on that note, uh, hold the applause, hold any amens for my Baptist buddies, right? <laughs> uh, we got to hold those, you know, keep them in your holster. And just because it distracts the person who's talking, and then it also takes time. Okay, so if you're applauding, they have to stop, and then you're taking time from them. And if you're applauding, you probably agree with them, so you want them to be able to talk. So, um, other than that, I think we're going to be okay. I think uh, we can do this together. We can make it through this, right? Um, I guess I did. I did teach high school debate. I forgot about that, so I'm somewhat qualified to, to be up here. And mainly, I'm just going to be running the time. So, I'm be watching the time. They're going to get a five-minute warning, and then because we're not, this isn't a super duper thing. They're just going to wrap it up when I tell them that that's the time, you know, a sentence maybe or two. Uh, we're not going to just cut their mic off, okay? All right, so for the thriller in Manila, playing the role of Muhammad Ali, we're going to introduce 
Vic Scar Scaravelli, which is uh, on my notes. <laughs> uh, Vic teaches here and multiple nights a week he informed me. And so um, if, if you guys attend here, I'm sure you know him. And I've gotten the pleasure of knowing Vic for about a month now. But hey, he's fun. We've had, we have more in common than I expected. So uh, go ahead and sit down. Yeah, thanks, thanks for coming. And uh, also, we have to say thanks for having us in this, in this beautiful building, too. This is really cool. And it beats doing it outside. So, uh, and then this is Pastor Matt. Roar Rock. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Pastor Matt is the pastor at Evergreen Baptist Fellowship. And if you want to join him for Bible study, uh, he does a Bible study on Friday nights at 6.30. Everybody's welcome. If you want to come and just, uh, you know, talk shop with him. That's pretty cool. And in all, in, in uh, interest of full disclosure, I attend Pastor Matt's church. Okay. So we're going to try to be as fair as possible. So Vic gets to have it on the home field turf. Pastor Matt gets to pick the moderator, right? So that sounds kind of weird. And uh, he paid me twenty dollars. <laughs> Open at twenty-five. Thirty? Oh wow. Okay. Okay. I will stop talking and we'll get this started. Okay. Anybody have a, any? Oh, and then questions. There's going to be a question time after the cross examination. We will stop the questions at 8.30 and give people a chance to leave if they want. And if you want to stay and then ask more questions, uh, I'm a night owl, I'll be here, so I assume these guys will too. So uh, feel free to stay as long as you want, ask questions, uh, discuss things. It's, it's really a cool opportunity. It really is a blessing. Okay? All right. And, oh, and um, this is just the way it works. Opening statements, Pastor Matt will go first. Rebuttal, Pastor Matt will go first, and then cross-examination, uh, Vic will go first, and Matt will go second, okay? So it just kind of alters it up a little bit. All right, Pastor Matt, it's all yours. I'll just start when you start talking. Let me prepare really fast. Okay, uh, thank you for allowing me to come here tonight. I've Can been you talking talk to the microphone a little bit more. Yeah, well, I have to get kind of close to it. Yeah, this is going to be kind of hard oh, here. There you, there you go. go. I could always just, well, yeah, it's going to be awkward. But my name is uh, Past. Can you hear this? Yes. 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 Uh, my, I'm Pastor Matt at Evergreen Baptist Fellowship, and I've been talking to Vic now for several months, and we're friends. And there's a lot of stuff that we agree on, but there's a few things we don't see eye to eye with. So I hope my goal tonight is to uh, that you will not remember my name or Vic. You probably won't remember Vic. But uh, that we will have uh, done our presentation so articulate that you'll be able to understand our arguments and be able to go home tonight and think about what's been said. So that, uh, I'd like to begin first with uh, where and how does a Christian find ultimate and final truth? You know, we live in a time where truth is said to be relative that there are no standards and that what is true for one person might not be true for someone else. But is this consistent with reality? Is this how the world that God created works? Since this is not really how the world works, the question becomes, how can you know what is true? How can we have certainty in what we believe? God has graciously given us the answers to these questions. So let's take a look at how he has done so. The vast majority of what we know comes from testimonies. Whether it's a testimony of our senses, past experience, or the testimony of other human beings, we're constantly taking in information every day. 
If that is the case, then how can we know something in an ultimate sense when all of our means of taking the inf uh, information in are fallible? Our senses are not completely reliable. One thing we can know for certain about human beings is, well, that we're all fallible. What if we could receive testimony from someone who not only knows all things and is, and is incapable of error, but also morally perfect and all-powerful? Someone who created the world around us, created us, and desires for us to know what he has revealed to us. What if this perfect being also gave this information to us in a source that was not only without error, but was incorruptible and guaranteed to last until Judgment Day? This would definitely solve the question of how we can possess ultimate knowledge. The infallible being is the triune God of Israel and the inerrant perfect means for sharing knowledge with us is the Holy Scripture. Now I'd like, before I uh, get into the question, I'd like to define some terms. Uh, if, if you're talking to somebody of a different faith, or let's say even of the same faith, sometimes we will use the same terminology, but we're gonna, we mean different things. For instance, if you're talking to a Mormon, and, and you both would say scripture, but we mean different things. For the Mormon, for me, I believe it's the 66 books of the Bible, that's scripture. For the Mormon, they're not, they will agree with the 66 books, but they're also going to say it's the Doctrines and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, and the Book of Mormon. So when I say scripture tonight, I mean the 66 books of the Bible. Another term I'd like to define is Christian. Okay? A Christian is somebody that's placed their faith in Christ alone, who is born again, and has the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is not only is in every single Christian. No matter how long you've been in the faith, to a babe in Christ, we share the same Holy Spirit. So the question is where? Where do we get this ultimate and final truth? I say it's the 66 books. I think everybody in this room agrees with the New Testament, 27 books of the New Testament. You had to either have been an apostle or an associate of an apostle. A couple of qualifications, there's quite a few qualifications for an apostle, but a couple of them, they had to have been with Jesus during, during his earthly ministry, and they had to be a witness of his bodily resurrection. That's in Acts chapter 1, verse 21 and 22. But we all agree the 27 books of the New Testament. So now what about the Old Testament? The Old Testament is what in the first century, it was long before the first century, but when Jesus uh, was walking the earth and he, and he taught in the temple, what he used was the Tanakh. Now the Tanakh, before I explain what the Tanakh is, uh, in Hebrew, you had, they only wrote in consonants. Okay, and it wasn't until about the 5th or 10th century B.C. that they started adding vowels. And, and mainly for pronunciation purposes. So Tanakh, in the original Hebrew, is T-N-K. T stood for Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And the Hebrew word is Nevi'im, which is prophets. And then K is Kethlem, which is the writings. So when you go to Scripture, you go to... Um, John or Luke chapter 6 verse 44 and 45 let me read that Luke chapter 6 verse 44 and 45 no, I'm sorry I keep okay, it's Luke I'm in the wrong book Luke chapter 24 verse 44 and 45 it says then he said to them these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the Law of Moses and the Prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the Scriptures. So Jesus' concept of the Scriptures encompassed the entire Old Testament as seen in its reference to the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. At that time, one way of referring to the Old Testament was to speak of its three-part division, 
the law, the prophets, and the writings. The Psalms were the first book in the writings. So Jesus, when he said Psalms, he meant the writings. So he's referring to the Old Testament as in the Tanakh. And the Tanakh actually had 22 books, but it's the same exact 39 books that we have in our Bible. The reason is it's the same content that's in the Tanakh that's in the Old Testament. They had 22 books then, but what we did is we, they had uh, Samuel's one book, but we, we divided the first and second Samuel. Chronicles was one book. We divided that into first and second Chronicles. Ezra and Nehemiah was one book. What we divided, that's where we get our 39 books. But besides Luke uh, 24, I mean, yeah, Luke 24, we can also go to Matthew chapter 23. And in verses 34 and 35, says, but when the Pharisees heard, I'm in the wrong chapter again. Thirty-four, thirty-five. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, and the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So Jesus, again, what he's saying is uh, we find the death of Abel in Genesis and the murder of Zechariah in Second Chronicles. The Tanakh began with Genesis and it ends with Second Chronicles. So Jesus, again, is confirming the Old Testament canon as 39 books. So again, when I speak of Scripture, I'm speaking of the 66 books. Again, where? God speaks to us in Scripture. When you go to Matthew chapter 22, verse 29 through 31, listen to these verses very carefully. It says, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, and I'll stop there, have you not read what was spoken to you? Have you not read the written scripture that God speaks to you in? Is what Jesus is saying. If that's true, if God speaks to us in scripture, then we can know a lot of different things. We can know, for instance, that we're sinners. We can know that we're fallen creatures. In Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's every single person. That's every single human being. The only human being that was sinless was Jesus Christ. And he's the second Adam. See, he wasn't born under the first Adam, he's the second Adam, and Paul refers him to as the last Adam. But only begotten in Greek is monogeneus. Monogeneus means only begotten, but it means unique, one of a kind. Only Jesus Christ was ever sinless. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 19, we have, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, I don't know, I'm not going to say anything there. <laughs> and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. For thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your voice, the face you shall eat bread, to return to the ground, for out of you were taken... For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And the reason I read this is because not only is every human being affected by sin, but so is nature. Nature is also affected by sin. So again, who's a Christian? A Christian is somebody that's placed their faith in Christ alone for salvation. Again, we get that in Romans. Let me go back to Romans chapter 3, verse 24 through 26. It says... 
being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at this present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Or let me read Romans chapter 4, verse that. 2 through 5. <laughs> For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10, we can know this because God speaks to us in Scripture. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For again, we can know these things, but you notice it says, for by grace you have been saved. Remember I said, not only are human beings affected by sin, but so is nature. And that means that grace comes directly from God to us. What is grace? Undeserved favor. So how? And it starts asking how. The question is where and how does a Christian find ultimate and final truth? How? By reading and hearing it. You know, there was, um, let me read something in my notes. The Old Testament is full of types of Christ, such as the animal sacrifices which pointed towards the coming Messiah, who would put an end to the endless sacrifices. The temple was the dwelling place of God whom Christ fulfilled with his coming, and now his people share fellowship and intimacy in Christ. It's an important phrase to remember, in Christ, not of essence of Christ, it's only one essence, and that's God, but in Christ. Jesus Christ fulfilled the office of high priest through his sacrifice and resurrection. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11 through 8, 7. And allows us free access through faith alone in him. Remember I said grace comes directly from God to the Christian. Because Jesus Christ fulfilled all the types and shadows of the Old Testament, there was only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5. There are different mediators in the Old Testament, such as Moses being the most famous one, probably. You know, before I move on, Moses, you go to Exodus chapter 17, remember in Moses, they were fighting the Amalekites, and every time Moses had his arms raised, they, would, would win the, they were winning the battle, but when he got tired, and they make a point of it, he's tired, he'd drop his arms and they start losing the battle. So they put two stones on his arms to keep him held up so they could win the battle. That's showing us that Moses only prefigures to the one mediator that will come. It all pointed to Christ. These mediators in the Old Testament included prophets, kings, and priests. Prophets were responsible to bring the word of God to the people while kings were commanded to bring and allow his righteous rule to permeate throughout the culture. Priests represented people in coming before God's presence. Jesus Christ has fulfilled all three functions. He's our prophet, king, and priest. So what happens? I say, uh, how? The Holy Spirit. Remember what a Christian is. A Christian is somebody that's indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He's our fallible teacher, the Holy Spirit. So what happens when you come across a passage in Scripture that you don't really understand? Isn't that what Peter said in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16? He said, Paul writes some things to some of you it's hard to understand. You know what that does? It should drive us to prayer. These notes I actually wrote, so it's not like... And, um, when we struggle and see clarity concerning Scripture, it will drive us to prayer and dependence on the Holy Spirit, which results and is an outgrowth of our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If we're depending on human teachers to give us understanding, 
then our relationship will focus on them and God won't be priority one. It is through the process, it's through this process that the Lord is working patience, love, humility, and other sanctifying graces in our character when we don't see eye to eye with other believers. We have an infallible teacher, that's the triune God of Israel. The problem's with us, okay? We don't need the problems with us. One reason we find many verses in the Bible and doctrines troubling and hard to understand is because of the sin and darkness that's still lodged in our heart. Teaching. Okay? Luke. Remember I read Luke 24, 44, 45. The one part of that verse I love is, and he opened their understanding to comprehend the scriptures. The Lord opened their understanding. You have John 6.45. Let me read John 6.45. John 6.45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. And he's actually quoting Isaiah 54.13. All who has heard the, the Father comes to me. Acts 16.14. Lydia and the, it says, And the Lord opened her heart to understand the things spoken by Paul. We have Romans 8.16, 1 John 2.27, about the Holy Spirit bearing witness with our spirit. I just saw my time. i got to get going. <laughs> Between the first and second comings of Christ, the Holy Spirit gives birth to the church. He empowers its mission, he guides it, he endows it with gifts, grants its unity, establishes its leaders, and he teaches us. Together with the Father, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit not for the continuation of the Incarnation, but for the continuation of Jesus' mission of saving fallen people. The Holy Spirit opens our understanding and illuminates Scripture. He speaks to us through his word confirms the truth in the inner chambers of our heart, it even speaks to us through teachers and other people. But it's our responsibility to search the scriptures and make sure what is being taught does not contradict the 66 books of the Bible. You know, you go to Acts 17.11, says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. That's Paul. Here's the Berarians listening to Paul, an apostle, but they go back and they make sure what he said was true. You're not going to rely on you. You have, to, you have the responsibility to understand what this Bible uh, teaches. Galatians 1.8, again, Paul. But even if we... Now notice he says, we, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, let him be accursed. Even if we, Paul's saying, even an apostle, even if somebody else teaches you another gospel, we always focus on the angel, but he says, even if some other human beings teach you another gospel, let him be accursed. It's our responsibility to search the scriptures and make sure what is being taught doesn't contradict the Bible. Let me say, when I... When I say 66 books again, that doesn't mean I have about two to 300 books at home, okay? My church has a, uh, uh, t uh, a confession of faith. I watch other pastors, I watch other teachers. That's all fine. I go by councils and creeds, the Apostles' Creed. I'll get to that if I get time here. I go by all these different councils and creeds also, as long as they don't contradict what's in the 66 books of scripture. You know, 1 Peter 2.2, 2, it says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow by, thereby. That Greek word for desire is the same word that David uses in Psalm 42.1 when he says, Like a deer pants after water, so do I pant after you, O God. So in other words, with our new nature, we, we have that desire to study and read the word of God. Hang on, oh, almost done. Each Christian has experienced a divine aspect of Scripture with its power and authority because we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. 
If I try and explain the taste of an orange to a person who's never tasted one, they're never going to understand because they haven't experienced it. Okay? The church didn't establish a canon, but only recognized what God had already divinely inspired. The Holy Spirit bears witness with each Christian in the books included in the divine canon. The church recognizes what God has already divinely established in his canon. I say I, I belong to the one true church. When you say one holy Catholic apostolic church, one means one is only one faith in the world. Holy means because of our new nature, we desire holiness to uplift and glorify God. Catholic means universal. One whole and apostolic means we go by what the apostles and the prophets have given us in the 66 books. Maybe a good way of, of saying this is we have one canon of scripture, 66 books. We have two testaments, the old and the new. We have three creeds, the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, and Athanasius Creed. We have the first four councils. The Nicaea Council, the Constantinople Council in 381, the Ephesus Council in 431, and the Chalcedonian Council in 451 over five centuries. I belong to that church. Thank you for giving me the time. So now Vic has 25 minutes for his open. Maybe they need a little stretch break. <laughs> you can get a stretch. How about it does a quick stretch break? Since I'm going to be talking for an hour and a half. <laughs> Ready? Okay. Whoa, there seems to be an interest in a Protestant Catholic dialogue, especially on a topic that's of vital importance to each one of us. I'm just curious, how many of my Protestant friends are here today? Good. Good. And my Catholic friends? Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for taking the time to be here. I commend you for taking your faith seriously and wanting to learn more about it. And special thanks to Pastor Matt for coming and having a dialogue. Some may be wondering, why should we have a discussion between two Christians who may have different points of view? Why don't we just do our own thing and not engage with others who believe differently than ourselves. Well, I believe Jesus answered that question for us in John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32, where he said, the truth will set you free. In other words, we need to know the fullness of truth in order to follow, know, and live our lives as Christians. And I'd like to make this point. All Christians have truth. But our goal is to find the fullness of truth. Well, tonight, Matt, Pastor Matt and I will present to you what sources we use to search for God's truths, as well as who has the authority to do this. And I'd like to make this perfectly clear, although we may disagree on some things, it's the theology and not the person, because Matt's a really nice guy. There are three questions that I hope we address tonight. What is truth? Where is truth found? And who is authorized to tell us that truth? Wouldn't it be great if Jesus established a way for us in 2023 to know truth with absolute certainty? What I'd like to do tonight is to present to you the Catholic understanding of how we address this question. And my goal tonight is not to give you my personal interpretation of the Bible. Rather, it is to present to you what the Catholic Church has taught for the past 2,000 years. To determine where authentic Christian truth can be find, found, I believe we need to follow the advice of an Anglican priest who converted to the Catholic Church in the late 1800s, John Henry Cardinal Newman when given the reason why he converted to the Catholic Church, once said, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. In other words, he said, in order to know authentic Christian truth, we need to go back in history and learn what the early church believed, practiced, and taught. 
So let's do that and see what method has been proven to give us reliable truth of God's revelation, the Protestant or the Catholic method. Let me go deep in history and look chronologically to give you the Catholic understanding of authority using common sense, logic, and most importantly, the Bible. I'll systematically establish the Catholic understanding based on known truths. So what is the starting point? Who is the ultimate source of authority of truth when it comes to our faith? Help me out here. Who's the ultimate source? Jesus. Jesus. Why is that? He's God. He's God. I think we all agree on the starting point of authority is Jesus. So point number one. Jesus is the ultimate source of authority in matters of faith because he's God. When Jesus walked the earth, if there's a question about a belief, all a person had to do is ask Jesus, and his answer would be final because he was authoritative. Well, since Jesus wasn't physically going to stay on the earth forever, what did he do to make sure later generations would know the truths he taught? The Bible tells us, in each gospel, we find, find that Jesus selected 12 men. And what were they called? Apostles. Apostles. Those were the men that Jesus called for a special role in his ministry. And I must emphasize, only the 12 apostles were initially selected and given this mission by Jesus. So point number two, Jesus selected 12 apostles who would be, commi would be commissioned to spread truth to future generations after he ascended to heaven. Now that Jesus selected 12 apostles for the task of carrying on the faith, the next step was to teach him all truth. For the next three years, Jesus taught the apostles everything he wanted passed on forever. There's an end given to all the teachings that Jesus taught just to the apostles. It's called divine revelation, the deposit of faith, or the Word of God. So point number three, the total revelation that Jesus taught the apostles is called divine revelation, deposit of faith, or the Word of God. What did Jesus command all the apostles to do with the Word of God just before he sent it in heaven? You know, we know the Great Commission, Matthew 28, what did Jesus tell the apostles to do in Matthew 28 in the Great Commissions? Go and... Go and... Make disciples. Make disciples. That's the what he told them to do. And how did he tell them to do it? Baptizing them and teaching them all that I commanded you. Notice Jesus said all and not just some of what I taught you. At this point, the mortal apostles were commissioned to do something impossible to do under their own power. To remember everything that Jesus taught them and to do it without error. How can they do it? They are mortal human beings. Jesus certainly knew that if it was up just to them, they wouldn't be able to do it. So what did Jesus do to ensure the apostles could go out and teach everything and do it without error. Two things. In John 14, 26, Jesus promised just to the apostles, the Holy Spirit will teach and remind you all that I taught you. Jesus promised the apostles divine help of the Holy Spirit. And secondly, Jesus made another very important promise to the collective group of apostles in Matthew chapter 18, verse 18. Whatever you do, apostles, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Did you get the magnitude of Jesus' promise? We know that God can't ratify or agree with something that's untrue. So if Jesus says he'll agree with a decision the apostles make on earth, that, tr that decision must be right. That logically leads to the fact that in order for this to happen, the apostles must have the ability to make infallible declarations when it comes to defining what's in the Word of God. 
So we know that Jesus gave the collective group of apostles the ability to make specific declarations that are infallible. The point number three, Jesus gave the collective group of apostles authority and promised they would, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, remember, preserve, define, and teach the word of God infallibly. Now that there was a group of 12 apostles who were given collective authority, just as in any organization, there needs to be a leader. So what did Jesus do about that? In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, Peter, I will build my church upon you. Not the other apostles, you, Peter. And in verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. What are the keys all about? This comes from Isaiah chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. In the Old Testament, the king had a person who was second in command, and that person was given keys to symbolize his authority. So Jesus gave Peter authority to be second in command. And for the next significant part of verse 19, whatever you bind on earth, Peter, I will bind in heaven. The same promise he gave to the collective group of apostles. The gift of infallibility was given also to Peter. So point four, Jesus gave individual authority to Peter as leader of the apostles and also gave him the ability to teach the word of God infallibly. There are only two times where Jesus made this promise of infallibility in the entire New Testament to the collective group of apostles and to Peter. There's a name given to this authoritative group of apostles under the leadership of Peter. It's called the church, or in Latin, magisterium. They were the ones who could authoritatively define and teach the fullness of truth that Jesus taught them. So point five, the magisterium or the church is the collective group of apostles under the leadership of the head apostle and their declarations were authoritative and binding. So Jesus established a visible church with a group of apostles and Peter as the head apostle that had authority. Problem, these men were mortal and they were gonna die. A very important question that now needs to be answered. Was the authority that Jesus gave the apostles and Peter terminated or lost when they died or was it passed on? We'll let the Bible answer this. Matthew 28, verse 20. Jesus promised, I will be with you, apostles, to the end of the world. The apostles were mortal. So logically, in order for Jesus to be with the apostles to the end of the world, he would have to have, they would have to have successors. There would have to be apostolic succession. Does the Bible verify this? we find that the very first thing the collective group of apostles under the guidance of Peter did after Jesus ascended into heaven was to choose a successor for Judas. In Acts chapter 1, verse 15 to 26, we learn this. Verse 20 says, May another take his office, equating an office to the position of an apostle. And in verse 26, it says, Matthias was counted among the eleven apostles. The apostles filled the vacant office of Judas with another person, and that person had the same authority as an original apostle. Later in the New Testament, we find the apostles passing on authority to others, such as Timothy and Titus, by the laying of hands. The Bible calls the successors of the apostles bishops. So point six, apostolic authority was passed on by the laying of hands by an existing apostle. And that office passed on was later called a bishop. Now that the authority and the gift of infallibility by the Holy Spirit was given to the collective group of apostles as well as Peter, the apostles began to spread the message of Jesus. The next question is, how did they do it? Well, the Bible tells us, let me read from 2 Timothy 1, verse 13 and 14. Take as your norm the sound words that you heard from me. Words that you heard. In other words, spoken words. And what was the name 
of Jesus' teachings in verbal form. 2 Thessalonians 3.6 We instruct you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to shun any brother who conducts himself in a disorderly way and not according to the tradition. The tradition. So Jesus' teachings in oral form is called tradition. This is how the faith was spread in the early church. So point seven. Tradition is the deposit of faith in oral form and is how Christianity was initially spread. Well, now that the apostles received authority from Jesus, were promised the Holy Spirit that would guide them in all truth, could make infallible declarations, what biblical evidence do we have? The apostles used those gifts. This is answered in Acts 15, where Paul and Barnabas encountered a heresy in the early church. Although Paul was an, was an apostle, had the authority of an apostle, what did he do? Instead of addressing the issue on his own, he went back to Jerusalem and brought the heresy back to the collective group of apostles. The Bible calls the gathering of apostles that dealt with this heresy the Council of Jerusalem. We find in Acts 15, the heresy was addressed by the apostles, and at the end of the council, a formal declaration was made by Peter. In Acts 15, 28, it is the decision of the Holy Spirit and of us. Notice how that declaration was made. It was made by using tradition along with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. And so, the first formal application of the promises Jesus made to the collective group of apostles. And this method of determining truth was the precedence of how Christianity would resolve disagreements about the deposit of faith or the word of God going forward. The formal gathering of the apostles and the guidance of the head apostle is called an ecumenical council. There have been 21 ecumenical councils in the history of Christianity. So point eight, when the magisterium meets an ecumenical council, the declarations are binding and authoritative. We know chronologically that after the churches were established in just oral tradition, some of the traditions then were later written down that became the New Testament. A very important question every Christian should be able to answer. How did the Bible as we have it today come into existence? Well, brief history of how our Bible came to be. The books that became the New Testament were written approximately between 50 and 100 AD. The first book was written about 20 years after Jesus ascended into heaven. By the second and third century, there were hundreds of books in circulation that claimed to be inspired. However, there were some disputed books in that list. During the first through the fourth century, various groups and church fathers documented lists of the books they considered inspired. Although some of the books in the various lists were similar, there were still differences in the list of books. There was no unanimous consensus until the end of the fourth century. Just for an example, James, Jude, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, and Revelation, about half of the New Testament, a quarter of the New Testament, were not considered inspired until the fourth century. So how was the Bible canonized? This is historical and objective fact. The first complete canon of scripture was recognized by the Council of Rome called by Pope Damasus in 382 AD. This council established the list of books in the Bible. Then at the Council of Hippo in 393 and the Council of Carthage 397, both of these councils produced the same list of books as the Council of Rome. Pope Innocent I officially confirmed the list of these councils in 405 AD. From that point in history, the canon was never questioned. The canonized Bible contains 73 books, 46 in the old, 27 in the new. This is how Catholics know with certainty the correct books in the Bible. It was an authoritative source that declared what the Bible is. 
This is a basic rule of logic. Only an authoritative source can declare something authoritative. The church did not make the books inspired. They were already inspired. The church determined which books were inspired among the many others in circulation by using tradition as criteria with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I believe we have to agree that if a source outside of the Bible, the church canonized the Bible, then that source had authority to make an infallible declaration if we believe the Bible contains the correct books. So point number nine, the Bible is tradition documented in written form and is both inspired and infallible. The Bible was canonized by the authoritative magisterium using authoritative tradition under the guidance of the Holy Spirit in approximately 400 AD and it contains 73 books. With the canonization of the Bible, all public revelation and the deposit of faith or word of God is contained in both tradition and the Bible. There is nowhere else where this can be found. found. And it has to be found in both because the Bible never teaches tradition is no longer valid. This now brings us to the function of the authoritative magisterium or the church. Scripture and tradition are the word of God. Nothing is more important in giving us God's revelation. <coughs> but what is in revelation? So who is that someone or group that can do this? Tell us what's in revelation. Let me quote to you how the Catholic Church has answered this question for the past 2,000 years. Guarding the deposit of faith, or the Word of God, is the mission which the Church entrusted to, which the Lord entrusted to His Church, and which she fulfills in every age. In other words, the authoritative Church, the magisterium, that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to guide it in all truth, would be the one who interprets and teaches what is in the Word of God. There are times when my non-Catholic friends will say, you Catholics, you place the church above the Word of God. That's incorrect. As I said before, the Catholic Church teaches that the Word of God is the ultimate source of God's revelation. Here's another formal teaching of the Catholic Church. Yet this magisterium is not superior to the Word of God, but its servant. The function of the magisterium or the church is to give us authentic interpretation of the Word of God. It does not invent new beliefs. It just teaches us what's in God's revelation. So for Catholics, we rely on the authoritative church to give us the correct interpretation of what's in the Word of God. So point 10, sacred scripture and sacred tradition are bound closely together. So they both provide the totality of God's revelation or the word of God. And the task of giving an authentic interpretation of the word of God in both forms has been entrusted to his church. I just gave you detailed biblical evidence of the Catholic understanding, how we know with certainty God's truths. Some people may not accept that. Well, in order to consider if the Catholic claim is true, I challenge you to answer two essential questions with either a yes or a no answer. If Jesus is God, and he said he would protect his church by sending the Holy Spirit to guide it in remembering all truth and gave divine assistance to the church to make infallible decisions, could Jesus make this happen? Question number one, if Jesus is God, the answer to that one has to be yes. Second question, did the magisterium, did this method, God's truths found in tradition in the Bible, preserved and taught by the magisterium, work over time? Do you realize that the church ever taught a belief from the word of God and then later changed it? That would prove it did not have the guidance of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can't contradict itself. 
Well, we're fortunate that we have 2,000 years of history to look back on. Did the church ever change a core belief? The answer is never. Never in 2,000 years has the authoritative Catholic Church ever changed a core belief. Doesn't that prove that the Holy Spirit is guiding the church? Now to answer the topic of this dialogue, where and how does a Christian find final and ultimate truth concerning the Christian faith? First, where is ultimate truth found? The Bible and tradition, the Word of God. Second, how is ultimate truth found? We rely on the authoritative church Jesus established and promised the Holy Spirit to guide in all truth. And so I'm going to be asking, Catholics, how do you know these truths? Well, in addition to sacred scripture, we have some tools. One of them is called the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is the official teaching of the Catholic Church, the Magisterium, that it has preserved over 2,000 years. And it gives us authentic understanding of what's in God's Word. And this book contains the official beliefs of the Catholic Church in the entire world. If a person in Klamath Falls, New York City, Munich, Germany, Tokyo, Japan, or any other city in the world wants to know what the Catholic te Church teaches officially, here it is. And when you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, on the bottom, it has footnotes. It footnotes all the Bible passages it gets the beliefs from, and all the parts of tradition where it comes from. Catholics are encouraged to read the Bible and better understand God's revelation. However, if there's ever a disagreement on a specific core belief, we can turn to the authoritative magisterium to settle the issue. In conclusion, since we do not have to reinvent the wheel and try to figure out truth on our own, we can take already defined truth and use it to live out our lives as Christians by following Jesus. Amen. 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 Okay, we'll take a short, like, five-minute break. But I think we need to uh, probably give them both a round of applause again. Yeah.